What's up, people? GNR TV, streaming done right. It has all the channels that you would want. You know, the regular channels, channels from out of state, pay-per-views, sports, the movie channels, porn. It has over 2,000 channels in general. Over 2,000 channels. $20 a month for two devices now. Not one, but two devices for 20 bucks, and you get all that amazing stuff. And I know what you're thinking. Oh, there's no sports right now. There's not really many pay-per-views. Well, guess what? There is sports because UFC is back. And there's pay-per-views because guess what? UFC is back, and the rest of the sports will be back eventually, and it's worth it. This app is freaking amazing. I highly, highly, highly recommend it. I've had it for a little over a year now. I'm never going to get rid of it, and I love it. I love it so much. GNR TV, streaming done right. If you don't have it, you need to get it. And enjoy the rest of the show. Let's get slicing and dicing with Sir Sturdy Horror fans. On this podcast, you will hear me and a guest do some movie reviews, random funny horror chats, and whatever else comes to mind. So tune in, kick back, relax, and always remember, I'll see you in your nightmares. Jason's mask. How's it going, ladies and gentlemen? I got the awesome guy Jason on here. Finally, we're doing something together. And uh, you did just drop your movie to YouTube for everybody today, which I did get the pleasure of seeing. Sometime, was it last year, right? When I did a podcast on that with one of my friends? Yeah, it was, it was sometime, I, th- I think late, late 2019, it, uh, it came out for, for all the, uh, the reviewers and stuff like that. And uh, today I decided since the pandemic is going around and everyone's kind of at home now with more time, I figured why not release it a little early and uh, cut it short on the festival circuit and show it officially on YouTube. So it is officially out there for the world to see and it's very nerve wracking, but I have faith in it. And I hope everybody likes it. So if you guys got 20 minutes free, uh, check out some art and see if you guys like it. Yeah, I, I enjoyed it. <coughs> Excuse me. It was one of those things where, like, it was hard to review because this is a spoiler show, right? And we couldn't spoil. Like, I, you know, me and you talked, and I was like, okay, we won't spoil it. But, um, yeah, it was just, it was just tough because it was twenty minutes, and then you can't really spoil it. But, right. and it's one of those stories where you really have to watch it to get what's going on, so you can't really explain the story without spoiling it too much. Right, and right. Did, like I said, we did it. <coughs> Damn. We did enjoy it, but it was just like, it was one of those things where I wanted more as far as, I wanted it to be longer. I'm like, okay, I need more. I wanted it to be explained a little bit more, and I wanted it to be longer to see where it goes from here, like the way it ended and everything. But I get, like, the budget. I get all that other stuff, and you want to just get your stuff out there, like a quick 20 minutes. Plus, I guess with the film festivals, you can only have them so long, too, anyway, right? Yeah, I mean, I mean, honestly, like 20 minutes is pretty much the sweet spot. I, I find like any time between like eight minutes and 20 minutes is kind of like what a lot of the festivals want for shorts. Uh, I didn't quite have the budget to do a uh, hour and a half feature film, which I eventually do want to do. But uh, the, I sort of tested the market with these kind of the short films, um, just kind of keeping them small cast, one location or two locations, and just trying to gauge the audience's interest and kind of see if my, my brand of dark psychological thrillers is something the audience wants. And the fact that you wanted to see more of it makes me feel like I did a decent job as a writer because now I want to give you guys a, a bigger taste and there, there could always be a, be a sequel in the future. So if you guys see it and you want more, please tell me so I can make a Limbo Cafe too. Definitely. I, I definitely want more. And it's just, I like your vision in it though. It was different. It was creative. It was like a fresh idea. <coughs> Excuse me. But um, yeah, I, like I said, I really did enjoy it. So how did you come up with the... um? Without giving it away, obviously, I was like spoiling. Like, how did you come up with the story? Or was it like, was it something that was hard to come up with? Or did you just like have an idea in your mind for a long time and you just put it out there? Honestly, for me, I mean, screenwriting is, is, is one of the blessings that I've been given the most. Uh, I, I feel most confident in my, my writing ability. And people often ask me, you know, like, what are your what are your influences? You know, what did you grow up on that made you want to write stuff like this? And while I obviously have a lot of things that I, I pay homage to, um, I try to write stories that I've never seen done before or never seen done well before. I feel like all my books, all my photo shoots, all my movies are all stuff that I've really never 
seeing done. So there's really nothing to compare it to as far as direct influences because I feel like, and this is a big soapbox thing and we could talk for seven hours about this, mm -hmm. but I feel like Hollywood right now especially is regurgitating the same old remakes over and over and over again. And it just really bothers me that we have such a technology and such a creativity out there that we're not tapping into. And I feel like here in the Pittsburgh indie scene, which is where I'm from, I feel like we have a lot of indie filmmakers now that are starting to really do some really good independent work. And I want to showcase really original stuff. I, I want to do stuff based on characters, based on journeys, based on the good and bad in all of us. And so I just sit down to think about, okay, what can somebody go through? And more importantly, how can that thing change them? How do they get through what they're going through? And how does it affect them and those around them? I try and write stories about the why of things and the how of things where I feel like most, most of Hollywood right now is doing the same old stuff. So I just want incredibly original things that make you think. I like that. And I agree with you with the, um, the Hollywood thing, but <coughs> they know as, as horror fans, we're going to go see it either way. If you do it exactly. all times or one time. <coughs> and I think, I think part of it, well, speaking for myself is it's like with certain ones where there's remakes, it's the nostalgia, and you're hoping that it sticks to that nostalgia from when we were kids or young adults, and nine times out of ten, they don't, but they know that they're going to get our asses in the seats. They know we're going to go see it, talking good right. or bad about it. Halloween, great example. I did like the one from um, 2018. I'm looking forward to the one this year. <coughs> Damn. Candyman, I'm really looking forward to. I'm yes. like, that. Yes. That's one of those horror movies, and I just said this on like two or three podcasts now. You're not really watching that movie for the kills as much. You are and you aren't, but that's one of those movies that the story has you in your seat, just like, oh my god, this is such a really good movie. Right. And exactly. If you, exactly. If you take the kills away, I'm not gonna say you could take it out of horror, but you can almost put it in another genre. Mm -hmm. In a sense, but the story the story is beautiful and I hope that I'm hoping that with the spiritual what is it, the spiritual sequel? I'm hoping yes. they stick with the story. I know they connect, but I'm hoping they stick with telling a really good story and not like focusing on let's say the kills, for example. If they have three or four kills like the one did or four or five, whatever, cool. Versus like a Jason movie. You wanna see twenty people getting killed in the movie because you're watching it mainly for the kills. You're not watching it for the story of Friday the thirteenth. I think so much that it's really in good hands too, because you know, this, the story of Candyman, I, mean, I guess without spoiling the original films is that it's very much based in racism. It's, it's in, the, mm -hmm. in the deep South. And, and the story is a love alone situation between a white woman and a black man and how, how that guy comes back to haunt and, and uh, take care of his wrongdoers. And what I like about this, it's so much is that Jordan Peele's producing and we've already seen Jordan Peele make social political statements um, do stuff with Get Out where he already covered racism. He covered a lot of stuff in Us about the government. And mm -hmm. that's a combination of some of the themes that are already in Candyman. So I think he's the right person to produce a film that is so based in racism and mythology like that. So I really think it's, it's in good hands. And I think Naya is going to be a good director as well. I'm super excited to see how they forward the story. And I'm so glad that it's not another remake, that it's an actual spiritual sequel so we can see how the characters progress. Because again, the progression of characters and where they've come from where they started is what makes viewers come back and want to see fresh movies. I agree with you 100% on that too. <clears throat> and I think what you're saying about Jordan Peele, it's in the right hands with him. And then with the lead, with the, the <clears throat> Jesus, with the woman, sorry, you have a black female who can give her perspective as well, which yep. I think is a great, great thing. I love seeing how diverse horror is becoming between races and genders. Like, I want to see more serious black roles, but I also want to see more strong female roles, or even, not even, a, not just roles, but, like, you know, producing and directing and all that. So you can get other visions, other, you know, the more diverse versions, sorry, not visions, version, well, yeah, visions too, of these type of movies, instead of just the same type of ideals from the same, not necessarily the same type of person, but you know what I mean, like, it's, it's more diverse, which I feel it's needed and it's welcome and it's welcoming now. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you. And I think that uh, every time that I go to festivals here in Pittsburgh in my local circuit, uh, they always have all the directors go up, up on, uh, by the big screen and kind of do a little question and answer. And they talk to all the directors and writers. And sadly, it's 90% it's predominantly males. 
And mm-hmm. lately we're finally starting to see more females. And again, that's why so many ideas are regurgitated over and over again, because you're getting the same perspective, the same white males are directing a lot of these things. I totally agree. And so I'm always encouraging my, my strong female friends to, to go out there and make movies because there are creative voices out there. We're just not seeing all of them. And so uh, my two ADs that uh, are my assistant directors for all my films, uh, including Limbo Cafe, uh, are, are two of the strongest, most creative women in the world. And uh, I, I encourage them to continue directing and they're doing wonderful work right now. Awesome. And I'm glad we're, we're seeing more and more uh, females uh, creating these things. And my stuff always, if you notice, like in Limbo Cafe, is dominated by strong, intelligent, decision-making females. Because I think uh, if you look at the history of horror, uh, again, to get on the soapbox, but if you look at the history of horror, it is the final girl and the strong female protagonist and even sometimes antagonist are what makes these movies really matter and what makes them really get invested in by the audience. You know, if you look back at Jason Voorhees' mother and, you know, Nancy and, and all the classic, uh, mm-hmm. you know, final girls, they're the ones that make these movies really, really uh, connect with you. So I think we have to have more of those. Fields of Madness Behind You, for example, has a seven-year-old little girl as a protagonist, and she's a wonderful character because she's I- kind and she's deep, but she's also very inquisitive and very imaginative, and she has her mind open to anything, and I think we all should be more like her. That's awesome. <clears throat> so speaking of your book, before I even ask you the horror question, I'm going to ask you the generic horror question. What got you into writing? Books. I, you know what? Books, I'll say books and movies just because you do both. Sure, sure. Yeah, man. I, uh, I also write theater plays as well, and I've been writing a lot of photo shoot knockups too. Um, I just, I've been writing every day for a long, long time now. I, uh, I remember just sitting, uh, I guess this kind of goes into your, uh, your loving uh, horror question, mm-hmm. sitting on my, my mom and my aunt's uh, living room floor in front of the big console TV, just watching all the classic slashers in the 80s. Okay. That's why, that's why my company is Nostalgic Nightmare Productions. Hope we can see the shirt here. Nostalgic Nightmare Productions is just based on the 80s and 90s style of horror that I grew up on. And uh, I was like, I was like six years old when I wrote my first novel. I wrote this like 25 page slasher okay. when I was seven years old and uh, it was misspelled, misformatted and all this stuff, but I was seven, you know, give me a break. But uh, I just remember love, loving the idea of like writing a story and seeing where the characters go and just trying to make the audience feel tense and feel scared. I just always, that was my creative outlet was always sitting down in front of a computer or with a tablet and just like writing uh, any kind of thing in the world. Mm-hmm. And I, I just feel like it was an escape for you to create characters and immerse yourself in that world. And that's a big part of why I do this. So to me, it was ingrained at a very young age. My, my mom used to write little short stories she kept in her basement. And then I did the same thing at a very young age. So I've been doing this for 20 plus years now. And I just, I love the idea of being able to create something that other people can watch and immerse themselves in and forget about their real lives. That's really cool. That's real cool. Cause it's like, <coughs> just, so you've been doing it since you were six or seven. That, that right there is kind of rare because I've been asking people lately, like, you know, about what got them into directing or how did they get into it? And for the most part, a lot of them got into it, like, just later on in life when they're older, at least teen years or something, like, really started catching it. But you were interested since you were a child as far as writing, which I think is amazing because what kids like to write? Right. What kids right. like to read and write? I mean... Well- I mean, kids that grow up reading Stephen King books when they're 10 years old and reading, reading uh, Kevin Williamson and Wes Craven and R.L. Stein and people like that. When, when I see a witty script or I read a witty book, I can't put it down. I have to watch the entire franchise or read the entire novel in one sitting. And that's the kind of thing that makes me want to write those kind of things for okay. others to do. That's mm-hmm. awesome, man. That's, that's, all, that's inspiring, too, because it's just like you said, you, again, when you wrote your first novel at six or seven years old, you know, misspelling, who cares about, I mean, I can't spell now. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's just, do you remember that novel? Or do you yes. Still have it? Uh, yeah. I, it, it's, it's on a floppy disc on my old Apple computer. I was, it was like, you know, I remember be, it was like uh, 1993 or 94. Uh, it was, uh, it was about a boy in the mountains and uh, he was, it was playing, uh, he was playing like catch with a ball or like a football with his buddy and uh, his buddy fell over the, the edge of this ledge they were playing on and he felt guilty for, for his friend being dead. And mm. uh, so it was him being haunted by his, by his friend because he felt necessary for, for killing him. And so it was just this, uh, this tense tension uh, haunting story. And uh, again, I don't, I don't know if it, I don't think I ever even submitted it to anything. I was really, really young. I just thought it was cool that like, I remember seeing the pages change as you're writing, you know, you get to the next page and thinking it was really cool that I was writing so much. 
uh, at a young age. I, I just thought it was, oh, wow, seeing the page number keep increasing. Wow, I must have a lot of ideas. So I always thought it was cool because awesome. I've just always had these stories stuck inside me. And I feel like I feel like having a story stuck inside you is kind of almost painful in a way. Mm -hmm. Like it's, uh, you have this, people have their children, others have their, their fur children, their dogs and cats. I have my stories of my children, my, 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 my journeys, my character journeys are kind of my kids. So to me, when I have a fresh idea, I have to get it out there. I've got to sit down right now and write it. I have to go finish the project right away. I have this perfectionism gene that kicks in, man. And uh, so it just, to me, as soon as I get an idea, I got to sit down and just write 20 pages right on the spot. You know? See, that's good though. It's good to just get it out there. You're not making any excuses. It's like, look, I have this idea. I have to put it on paper now. And Going back to your, your first story you wrote, would, would you ever go back to revise it or share it? Or? Uh, I, I, haven't, I haven't even seen it really probably since I was maybe 10 or 11 years old. I remember pulling it up when I was uh, preteen, just kind of trying to see what it was about again. Uh, I haven't looked at it since. I hope the floppy disk still works because technology of those days is kind of failing <laughs> us now. Uh, so I got to pull the old floppy disk out and see if I can find a way to even play it because that computer I think is dead. So I hope that we can save this file. But uh, someday... I would love to actually go back and, uh, and, and, and revise it. I did find um, fairly recently, I was going through my stuff. I was cleaning out my house in December and I found a notepad that I scribbled the idea for a movie down probably uh, 15 years ago. And that movie uh, is called Mindbender, which I did, I did release in 2017. Uh, so I had an idea for a film in like 2008 and then nine or 10 years later, I actually, without knowing I had written it down years before, had gone and actually made it and it won some awards. So it's pretty cool that, uh, that's real cool. Yeah. That's really cool. <coughs> so you, I can tell you have a huge passion for writing and directing, but yes, uh, what, about, uh, everything. what about acting? Yes. Uh, so I, I'm also an actor, uh, as you'll see, uh, behind you in Grave Encounters that the film poster that's right behind you. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that, that is my face and my name right there. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, I'm, I'm bad at this part too, the pointing thing. Other side, yeah, it's, it's, it's on the film side of you. But uh, that's uh, actually right where you're sitting is right next to my face uh, on your left. Uh, so, yeah, um, I, I just acted in that film that I, that I also wrote, directed, and produced. And uh, that's going to be coming out. It was due to come out last week in a public theater, but because of the pandemic now, I had to wait on it. Uh, so as soon as we're able to all get together in public again and not infect each other, I'm looking forward to releasing that to the public. I have also done, I've done a lot of theater acting. I've done a lot of Shakespeare and I've done a lot of short films. Um, so I just hope to continue to do more of that stuff. Um, okay. I, I audition for a ton of things. I've got several auditions right now that are hanging out there waiting for responses, whether I get the roles or not. And uh, mm -hmm. I, lo I love to act because again, if you can make someone believe in your story and find emotion based on the way you're portraying it, then you're doing a good job. And again, any way I can create a positive escape and a positive way to spend someone's time to get their mind off of the hardships of life, that is the reason why I'm an artist. So uh, if I can do that through my, my facial expressions, then I'm doing a good job. That's awesome, man. That's really cool. So do, do you have a preference as far as like writing, producing, directing, acting, or is it just any? Like you, you don't mind doing any? You like them all about the, better. Let me rephrase that. Do you love one more than the other? Or do you love them about the same? Um, I, I love all of them very much. Uh, they're all individual beasts. They, they all come with a lot of different uh, positives and negatives. Um, mm -hmm. I would say that in terms of the one that I can do the most easily and the one that comes with the least amount of tribulation is probably writing. Uh, I, I think writing is my best skill. Um, and it's definitely one of God's gifts that he's given me for sure. Uh, but I do enjoy all of them. And anytime someone calls me to do any of those jobs, uh, also script supervising, also any kind of theater job, running lights and sound, running camera. I also do a lot of VP work director of photography work. Uh, so anytime that I can run a camera, I also enjoy. Anytime that I can take photos, I enjoy that as well. So I'm a person of many passions. I do stand-up comedy. I do poetry performances. I have a charity foundation. So I just do a million things, and I just try and stay as diverse and busy as possible. That's awesome. So you just pretty much try to keep yourself busy, which is a great, great freaking thing. And everything that you saw, it sounds like everything that you're keeping yourself busy with is something you have a passion for which probably drives you to work even harder at it. Even those times where you're just like, shit, this is taking so long. I just want to give up or just stop, and, you know, just turn it off, for example. But then you go back, you might take a 10 minute break, half hour break, whatever the case may be. And then you get back to, you know, you know what? I love this stuff too much to just stop just because I'm having a hard time right now. 
Yeah, no, it's, it's definitely intrinsic as artists for, for us to question ourselves. I actually, last night was questioning myself because uh, I've got this photography storybook coming out pretty soon. It's called The Weeping Woods, and it's a 70s style exploitation kind of a, kind of a book that mixes uh, a story and uh, a, a photography. So there's a story on one page and a photo on the next page showing you what's happening. It's my first time doing a storybook. And uh, the formatting of this thing is very tough. It's very hard to get the photos and the text to line up and all the files to go together in my computer to acquiesce. So um, the writing and producing of it has been very, very fun and very easy, but the formatting of it has been a pain in the butt. So it makes you question yourself as an artist. Uh, once a week, I'm going, man, what the hell am I doing with my life? What's wrong with me? But then you see it come out and you go, man, it's all worth it now because it came out great. So uh, we definitely are, are quick to question ourselves as artists because we want to do a great job. We want the audience to like our stuff. We want to entertain. We want to be perfect. But perfectionism is a strong gene, but it's not actually reality. So when something goes wrong, it's very easy to go, man, why am I doing this? Yep. <clears throat> yep. No, I get, I get that, man. That makes plenty of freaking sense. But it's just, again, it's one of those things where I feel you just sometimes, sometimes you do got to shut stuff off and just kind of relax, even if just for a couple hours, even if it's for a day, to kind of refresh even just refresh and then you get back to it or for you because you have so many different patterns you can probably just like okay well i'm tired of writing this story right now i have maybe i have writer's block for this but i have another idea for this one right here mm -hmm. so let me get these ideas out here and then or shit sometimes you just want to sit down and watch a movie even and just right relax. yeah my, my my film collection definitely gives me a lot of breaks from this stuff there, there's times when my, my my physical body um so i was born disabled i have cerebral palsy and uh so my physical body sometimes when i'm sitting in chairs my spine is all fused and, and my, my legs have had i've had like 12 major surgeries in my life mm -hmm. so um, sometimes just sitting in a chair for too long just physically hurts a lot you know you're sitting there writing and you're up in this certain posture position for so long that your body is physically numb so I have to get up just to shake it out and go watch a movie just to sit in a different place so I don't feel uh, physically in pain anymore. So sometimes you're forced away because of your body. Uh, your mind is still going, but your body hurts too much. So yep. sometimes you go and you watch a slasher and you get renewed and you go, oh, yeah, I'm putting this in my next book. So uh, I hope exactly. so. <laughs> See, that, that's cool, though. And that, that's cool. I mean, your, your disability, too. You're not, you don't use it as an excuse to not do what you want to do because there is plenty of people who – <clears throat> like, I have, I have a cousin who's disabled, he's in a wheelchair and all that, and we make jokes all the time because he's an asshole, but I don't treat him any different. I treat him just like he can get up and walk around. Like, I'm not going to treat him any different because he's in a wheelchair. I do help him if he needs it, but, like, <clears throat> I get what, but he, like, for him, he doesn't make excuses of, like, he works for the state, so he's, he, he doesn't have to, but he works, mm -hmm. and it's like, he's just like, hey, I want more, I want to do this, I want to do that. Like, you're focusing on your dreams, you're doing something, you don't have to but you're doing that because you have a passion for it. You're not using your disability as an excuse. Like some people will. And I, I don't want to sound like an asshole when I say this, but I feel like, I feel like some people do to an extent, depending on their disabilities, you know what I mean? Obviously men, there's mental, physical, but I'm just saying like ones where you're, one where you're able to do something mentally or physically do something. I feel some do because maybe some of the way they were raised, like sometimes their parents treat them a little different or kind of baby somebody a little bit because of that. Versus like, look, I mean, I'll help you with this, but you can still fucking do this, 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 and this. You, you, you're not that, you know what I mean? You're not that bad. <clears throat> you're what, there's, and, there's, and like, I, that's one thing I do respect about, well, with you now, I didn't even know that. And with my cousins, it's like, he goes after, he does what he has to do to take care of his son and take care of himself and like, just has a good time, does what he does. He coaches a football team for a flag, which is cool too. And then like, with you, with all the horror stuff that you do, you're not, you're not like, just how you're saying how, you, you know, your body hurts after a while from sitting too long. Somebody else who has the same, not the same drive and passion, I'll say, but the same um, love for horror to an extent or whatever, or love to write, they may use as an excuse. Oh, well, I can only sit here for so long, so I can't do this. And I can't, instead of just like, you know what, I can sit here. Say if you can only sit there for 20 times. I don't know how long it is, but say you can sit there for 20 minutes a day or 20 minutes at a time and write something. And then go lay down or relax, whatever you have to do, and then come back to it. There's some people that'll use that as an excuse. And this is even able-bodied people, too, that'll use an excuse for something that's why they can't do something. It's just like, just do it. If, it. if you can only do it for a few minutes, just do it. If you can do it for an hour, just do it. Just try. Eventually, things will get better. Eventually, <clears throat> you'll learn your body to where you'll know 
how much for you, for example, you, you know how long you can sit somewhere and how much pain you can take before you're just like, all right, I have to move. I have to walk around. I got to stretch. I got to go lay down or whatever the case may be mm-hmm. versus like someone who's like, okay, you know, you sit down, my back hurts. Okay. I got to get up. I can't do it. It's like, come on. Come on now. You push, you're, you're pushing yourself. Right. Well, well, the thing is, the way I look at it, too, is that we're all disabled in some way. You know, mine is a disability that when I walk down the street, you can see that I'm disabled. I have a limp. I, I walk a little slowly. I have some bad balance. I obviously have had a lot of surgeries, but yeah. I, I'm blessed with so many things. And I feel like we're all disabled in some way. Some have financial disabilities. Some have physical. Some have mental. Some have family problems. Some have oh, attention yeah. abilities. You know, we all have something different. Mine is just one that you can see um, as you're walking down the street. So for me, I was blessed with, you know, thank God that I was given abilities to do job from a chair. You know, I do a lot of journalism. I cover sports. I cover movies. I, I do a lot of things uh, for my living that I'm able to do by, by sitting in a chair and doing it. So thank goodness that I'm not only a physical laborer, that I couldn't do anything mental or I would be in a lot of trouble in life. So, so if I have the ability to do these things and I can create a world like in the way Stephen King has created Derry, my, my universe, my cinematic and, and, and thematic universe is called Pleasance after Donald Pleasance, who was oh, Dr. Awesome. Loomis in Halloween. Yes. That's awesome. uh, so, so yeah, so, so Pleasance is my dairy for Stephen King. And I feel like if I can create this universe and I can, I, I can fight through the pain to create something cool, I think we can all do it. You know, we, we oh, yeah. can all find our ways to make our impact on the world. We all impact the universe differently. And whatever way I can impact the universe and make somebody smile or make somebody jump or whatever, I'm going to do that. So, you know, we're only here for a short time, but we got to make this journey the best possible for ourselves. I agree. Got to make the Again, yes, make the best of life. And that's, I just find it awesome, like I said, because there's people who just, whatever the case may be, no matter what disabilities or not, no matter what, Oh, I can't do this. It's like, just try it at, at the very least. Even if you're not good at it, that's fine. If, you, if there's something you love doing and you're not good at it, keep doing it until you get good at it. Mm-hmm. Or, yeah, no, and I think that there's a fear of failure too, I feel like. I feel like a lot of times people are afraid to try because they're afraid to fail. Mm-hmm. And that's the thing that, that I've learned as an artist is that if you're going to be in this business, uh, be it whether it's film, theater, or uh, being an author, you're going to fail a lot. You're going to get a lot of rejection. You're going to get a lot of, of bad uh, feedback. And even today, just re- releasing Limbo Cafe in the public, I know that it's not going to get 100% positive reviews. There are going to be certain people that don't like certain things. And that's totally fine. You have to have a thick skin and, and be able to embrace failure. Because when I release a book or when I release a movie, the first thing I ask my friends is, okay, what about this sucked? Please tell me what sucked about this. Because if you all tell me that it's perfect and wonderful, first of all, I know you're all lying because nothing mm-hmm. is perfect. And second of all, I can't get any better. I can't evolve and grow as an artist if you tell me it's perfect. I have to yeah. know what I suck at so I can, I can key on it to improve on it. You've got to be able to embrace failure and realize that failure has the best lesson inside of it. I agree. I agree because it, that's like the nail on the head with that right there as far as what you're saying. When you're asking your friends for like, hey, how does you, how do you, what do you think about this? How do you think I did, you know, should I change anything about this? And they're like, oh, no, it's perfect. It's perfect. It's perfect. And it's like, all right. You guys are fucking lying because I just wrote dog shit, dog shit, dog shit. So you obviously didn't read it. <laughs> so go ahead and read it and let me know what I need to fix. But no, it's, it's good that you get that feedback from your friends first before you really put stuff out there just so you can kind of, I mean, I feel like I, obviously, as you know, at the end of the day, I feel like what, what you feel matters, but at the same time, you do want people to love and feel your work and your creation. So it's like, I want to you know, I want my fans to love this as far as what, you know, I want my fans to enjoy this. I want horror fans to enjoy this. So I need to figure out other things. Maybe something that I might not be, I don't say that's something that you're not crazy about, but maybe something that I don't love as much as I love with this, but others may love it more just so I can get it out there more. And then I can add some other stuff that they may not love as much, mix it in with this and see what happens. Right. But, yeah. And that's the thing is everyone's palette is different. You know, like, like you and I could watch the same film, and I could think that it's garbage and you could think that it's amazing and vice versa. <clears throat> so, I mean, it's, it's so frequent out there to have differing opinions. So what one person might think is the, the, is the best novel I ever wrote. Somebody else might think, oh, I, I don't really understand that. That's not very good. So that's happened plenty of times in my life where I've watched a movie and thought it was amazing and somebody else went, no, I, I didn't really enjoy it. So, like, oh, yeah. for example, with, with me as a horror fan, James Wan to me is kind of overrated. And I, I don't want to spend time bashing anybody on this podcast, but... I don't think that James Wan is the best storyteller in the world. I I think that he relies too much on jump scares. 
I think his stuff is repetitive. I think it kind of lulls in the middle and it kind of focuses on the same old uh, kind of tension building sound design, which mm-hmm. he does that well, but it's kind of all he does. So to me, everyone else looks at James Wan as being like, oh, he's, he's the best in the game right now. I, lo- I look at someone like a Mike Flanagan and I, or a Jordan Peele and I say, those guys are visionaries. Those guys are doing different kind of work. So that's not to slight James Wan. I'm just saying that our tastes are incredibly different. And so you got to be able to realize what someone else might love, somebody else might hate. So you've got to be able to get ready to accept criticism as long as it's constructive and be able to grow from that. I agree with you there. And um, my example of that is, Some people think Nicolas Cage is a good actor. I think those people are crazy, but, you know, (laughs) we all have different tastes. But, no, I get what you're saying, though. Like, it's just what I'm trying to do now, which I've been starting maybe maybe six months ago, maybe a year ago. But what I'm trying to do now is, like, when I do a movie review, if it's a movie I absolutely cannot stand or if I hate it, Mandy, for example, I did not like that movie. Agreed. I try to find something cool about it, like, even if it's something something funny and cool, like I said, uh, what did I say I liked about it? I said I like Nicolas Cage's tiger shirt. In it. So that was me saying something nice about the movie and Nicolas Cage because I, I, I just do not like Nicolas Cage. I, I feel like he's the same person. In, just like you're saying about James Wan, like he does good. Well, I don't think Nicolas Cage does good work, but how you're saying he does good work, but it's pretty much repetitive. I feel like Nicolas Cage plays the same character in every movie. No matter what the movie's about, it could be a love story and he's playing himself. It could be a horror movie and he's playing himself. It could be a cartoon movie and he's probably voice acting as himself. He's probably doing some ridiculous <laughs> stuff behind the scenes where you can't see him. Mm-hmm. But right, right. I do try to, because my brother pointed this out to me. He was like, I understand there's certain things you won't like, but it's, you have to remember that it's somebody's art. Because it's at the very least, try to find one or two things that you do like about it, which mm-hmm. sometimes it's just, some, I'm not going to lie, sometimes it's hard. Like it's really right. hard. So, like, what we'll do. My other brother, what we'll do is, like, when he's on here, we'll do something, like I said, the shirt that I said I like. Something funny about it. Just to kind of make funny, you know, make a joke about it, make it funny. And then there's other people who will love it. There's other people who will love that same movie that I hate. Like, well, who's another one I did not like at all? Tales from the Hood 2. Did not like. Yep. I don't, I haven't found one person that liked that movie a lot. No, we're pretty about, see, me and my brother still have this open challenge. And this is when the movie came out. We said, um... I think pretty much he said it. First of all, we do ratings on here, like when we're doing movie reviews. He gave it a – we do a 1 to 10 rating. I'll try to make it fun, like say if it's Jason, like 1 to 10 machetes or whatever the case may be. Yeah. He said uh, – I said 1 to 10 whatever. You know, I think we like the jacket in that movie. So 1 to 10 of those cool jackets for one of the, from one of the stories. And he gave it a negative 13. And I agreed <laughs> with him. And the reason why he gave it a negative 13 is he said because – the original came out 13 years ago and they came up with this one. It was like the same director and all that. And it was just mm-hmm. awful. But, um, yeah, so yeah. No, it's, it's really sad whenever you see something like, like you watch the original and you're so excited about it. And then you, you wait five, six, 10 years for a sequel to come out and it just lets you down so much. Like, yeah. that's how I felt about it. Chapter two as well. Like, like the first, um, the first remake of it, I thought was excellent. And then the second one came out and I just felt like it was a huge letdown. You didn't so like, it just sucks whenever you build up to it. Oh, wow. I, enjoy, I really enjoyed that one. But again, difference of opinions, which I do love with horror, with any genre, you could say. But, um, you know, I feel like horror has the most passionate fans in the world, too. You know, it's oh, like you yeah. could watch a comedy or a drama and you might get a differing opinion, but you're never going to get the vitriol and the passion that you get behind a horror fan. You know, it's like same with I cover I cover a lot of uh, a lot of football and a lot of pro wrestling as well. And uh the, the fans, man, just like the differing opinions, they will get on you for your opinions pretty quick. Oh, yeah. You know what's funny about horror? That you meant, um, I, I bring this up all the time. Thanks, Killing. I love that freaking movie. I still have no idea why, but I just love – that's probably one of my favorite – if not my favorite horror comedy is definitely up there. But I bring that up because it's a killer turkey, and I think – I was talk, I talk to people all the time. Like, what other genre of movie – would you go out there and watch if somebody, you know, a horror fan, like, Hey, I just watched a movie about a killer Turkey. How can I see, how can I see that? Now, if I say, Hey man, I, I just went to the movies or I was watching online. I seen this movie about a superhero Turkey. No one's going to even, who cares? No one's going to want to see that shit at all. Or a romantic, you know what I mean? It, it just wouldn't work, but horror can literally go in any direction. You can have horror comedies. You can have a romantic horror in a sense. You can have the serious slashers, the mind fucks, all that stuff. And it's not going to be wrong. It's not for everybody, like every, anything else, but you're going to have that core group of fans. You're, and it's you're, that core group are almost like a cult of fans that just 
love it and will defend that movie to the death for whatever reason why they love it. Whatever reason. Another good example is Halloween 3. Mm-hmm. I seen that as a kid. As a kid, I hated it because, you know, and you can go out and grab a movie from the video store, mm-hmm. grab one or two movies at a time, and we would go through the franchises of certain movies, and that was one of them. And we got to part three, and I was just like, "What? what is this shit? Yeah. <laughs> but as as I got older, as an adult, and with social media, too, it does help. I watched it again maybe, shit, maybe eight to ten years ago now, maybe seven, eight years ago. I watched it since then, but I'm saying I watched it seven, eight years ago. I was, in, I was on Facebook and in a Facebook group, and someone was saying, watch Halloween 3 as a standalone film. Yep. Get that as a sequel, and then it'll give you a different perspective. Which gave me a way different perspective. I actually really like the movie. I'm not going to say I'm a diehard fan and I love it, but I do like it a lot. And another unpopular movie I'll say, I would think so, is um, which I love and I always loved, was Friday the 13th Part 5. Okay. With Roy Burns as the killer. Yep. It's not Obviously, it's not as good as when Jason's the killer, but... I like how I like the, you didn't know about it until the end. Like if if you've never seen that movie before, I'm sorry I spoiled it. I'm not really sorry though. But uh you won't you won't know about that until you don't know about that until the end. Mm-hmm. And I think they just did it so well cuz they had like the flashbacks of Jason too with Tommy. Mm-hmm. It was it was a fun movie. It was actually like for me out of the whole franchise it's like in the middle for me. And Reggie the Reckless is besides Jason, Reggie the Reckless is like my favorite character through the whole franchise. Yes, family. I love Reggie and it's but what's funny about that movie too is that, that as a movie it's one of the better it's one of the better campground style building tension character kind mm-hmm. of Friday the 13th movies. It's just that it's not Jason so so the ending kind of loses the audience a lot of times. As a film it, it is one of the better entries but then it gets to the end and it kind of kind of ruins it but uh, what's funny about that movie is the blue streaks under the mask give away that it's not Jason because when they do flashback Jason, you see the red the red streaks under the mask. And then whenever it's Roy, you see the blue ones. But watching it as a kid, you don't know to look for that. So you have no idea. Now as an adult, I go, oh, I should have known. Yeah, you, you don't know to look for that. And then I feel like as a kid, maybe even as an adult too, when you're watching those movies, you really get into it. You're not really... You're not really paying attention to that, and then, but then after you watch it, like how you're mentioning it now, you look back and you see it, and then as an adult, you look back and you see certain things and you point things out, and then just seeing, I'll say seeing it on DVD or Blu-ray versus VHS, more things are just, point, they just stand out. I mean, either way, you're going to see the blue and the red difference, but more things stand out for you more, so you're just like, oh, that's, yeah, that's cool. Like, I went to see, um, in the theaters, actually. I think it was the 25th anniversary of Nightmare on Elm Street. 25th or 35th, I forgot. A couple of years ago with my wife. It was They were playing in theaters, and it, it just looks so... I was just, this is the reason why they need to have a horror theater. Well, not now, because of this whole pandemic. But they need to have a horror theater that just, you know, theater just shows horror movies. Just, I would say just classic movies. Just classics from, like, maybe... And then I was thinking maybe maybe do a mix of both, do old and new, old and new, but show a ton of the old classics because who wouldn't want to go see, or if you aren't old enough, like the original Friday the 13th in theaters, any of those movies, Jaws in theaters, which I got to see that too as well mm-hmm. this past summer. Um, just, you know what I mean? Any of those, because it's just, it's just different. Like Texas, I would love to see Texas Chainsaw Massacre in theaters. I would love to see The Exorcist in theaters. Just. Cause I, I'm not, I don't know how to build a time machine. Cause that is something I would really love to do is build. Just imagine being the age you are, having the mentality you do, but going back in time and seeing these movies. You've seen them before, but seeing these movies for people who've never seen them and seeing them in theaters, that has to be exactly. Exactly, and and that's the thing too is that my my local theater around where I live here, uh, they do like five dollar Wednesday nights. So every Wednesday they would do a throwback movie that's like a super classic. Uh, it would be a different genre, so you might get horror, you might get drama, whatever. Mm-hmm. But uh, they would do Friday and, uh, or Wednesday night $5 movies, so for a cheap price, you'd be able to go watch a movie. So uh, around, around October, they do uh, all horror. So I got to see back-to-back weeks. I got to see the original Halloween, and I also got to see Psycho, uh, the 60s Psycho, the black and white Hitchcock, um, in theaters with a friend who had never seen those films before. So I got to watch them through her eyes for the first time mm-hmm. and see them on a big screen. And it just with the surround sound and the audience – who's all dedicated and knowing what to look for, but still being able to enjoy it as if you're in the moment for the first time really gives you that nostalgic remembrance of when you first watched it. And 
imagine how it must have felt back in the 60s when Hitchcock was doing closed door theaters where you couldn't come after five minutes of the movie. So mm. I just, I, I really enjoy those experiences, man. And I definitely am with you. They should do an all horror version because I'd be there every day. I'd be yeah, broken. I, <laughs> I know. Or I mean, at the very least, even what your town does as far as like once a week, but I, again, I'd say just stick it with horror maybe, or, you know, yeah, once a week, you know, stick with horror, say a Friday or a Saturday where they just show, even if it's just one horror movie, they just show that throughout the day, the same movie. It doesn't matter. I think it would really draw in a lot of fans and I think it would just be great because you get to see that on the big screen. Mm -hmm. And as much as I do like watching a movie from home because you can stop and pause and do whatever you want, you know, you could move around, do whatever you want to do while you're at home. There's nothing like going to the theater and just seeing the whole, the big screen. And I'm not rich yet. I don't have that kind of money to just get this at home, have my nice home theater with a, you know, a hundred inch screen <laughs> just hanging up on the wall. Like, hey, you going somewhere? No, I got the movies right here. Yeah. That would be beautiful. I wish, man. I would definitely, if I could just, uh, and that's a lot of what I do during October. I do the 31 nights of Halloween in my house. So mm -hmm. I play two or three horror films uh, throughout a day, and I just have them playing 24-7 uh, in the background. I have candy on the table. I have the whole house decorated. I have friends come in and out. I have beer. I have pizza. And I just love the immersive experience because horror brings people together. Horror unites communities like that. And especially in times like this when the world's a little scary, we got to find something peaceful to unite over and be able to be on the same page about. You know, politics right now has got us so divided, and I just hate the fact that there's no unity right now in the world because unity is what's going to save us all, and I feel like horror does that for us. So I just love the idea of having your friends come and go and have snacks and have drinks mm -hmm. and talk about classics and put yourself back in that place when you were a kid when you first discovered these movies because we've all got those nostalgic video store memories that I wish were still around today. Uh, me too, man. Me too. I just I, – I love it. It's just – it's – it's like nothing other. It's, there's just, like I said, I've been watching these movies since I was a kid, and there's nothing better than just sitting down, watching some horror with friends, family, whoever's into it with you, and just chilling, watching some movies, or just talking about movies, like, kind of like how we are now. It's, and it's crazy. that you're, It's funny because you're saying, like, sitting down, watching, being peaceful, watching horror movies. If you're thinking of slashes, there's, there's nothing peaceful about those movies. Right, sit down and watch a nice murder, right? But we're all sitting, but the thing is, we're all just kind of sitting down and just chilling, laughing, joking around about these movies. And again, horror, to me, horror is like the nicest genre as far as people go. The night they have the nicest fans. I've been to Comic Cons, which I never had any issues there. Don't get me wrong. And I've been to horror conventions. And I'll say with Comic Cons, not, I feel like not everybody really wants to be there. I feel it's one of those things where somebody's boyfriend or somebody's girlfriend or the kids are really into it so the parents just you know the whoever just kind of brings them in for support but i feel like with horror everybody who goes to those conventions are really into horror from the little kids up to the adults and they're really into it and it's just you kind of feel it when you walk into the building like the atmosphere is different like the comic-con atmosphere it's fun it's welcoming it doesn't feel negative but it just feels like the horror one like everyone really wants to be there the energy is different and i I love every freaking second of it. I cannot wait till this crap is over with and stuff gets back to normal just to be able to do those again. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. I, I've been blessed enough to be able to be a vendor for a lot of those horror conventions. Like I get invited to a lot of these conventions mm -hmm. uh, to sell my books and stuff like that. And just seeing the camaraderie, seeing everyone uh, point out everybody's shirts and, and how they, they like each other's designs and how there's like a bunch of makeup and stuff. People have the prosthetics on their face and just, just seeing the entire community be into whatever their version of horror is because horror's got all these subgenres. Oh, we were yeah. talking about earlier, you can have horror comedy, horror romance, you can have, you know, scarecrows or whodunits or slashers or whatever. And it's just everyone kind of representing their version of horror and there's no right or wrong answer. Everyone just loves what they love. And it's just, uh, it's got passionate fans, but everyone's kind of accepting of like the, oh, you must be into this click too because your shirt has all these things in it. So it's mm -hmm. just, I just love watching the community really enjoy it. Seeing little kids run up to Jason Voorhees guys in cosplay and taking pictures. Seeing uh, Betsy Palmer from Friday the 13th used to always tell the story of how people would hand their child to her to hold them for a picture. And she's like, why are you guys giving me your kids? I was a murderer in this movie but you guys are handing me your children because you, you love me that much as a character. So I think it's so cool that they would just hand Bethany Palmer a kid to get a picture with because she was the mom in the movie. So it's great. I, that's somebody I wish I could have met, man. She was awesome and awesome in that freaking movie. Really awesome. Did you get to meet her? 
I did not know. Uh, I've, I've actually got a little, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I've got a little $5 um, print that somebody in Pittsburgh made of her face doing the killer mommy killer thing. I have a little black and white, uh, like uh, floorboard little print that's hanging on, on my dresser when you walk into my guest bedroom. Uh, I was a huge fan of hers and I watch her interviews all the time. And I love that she only did Friday the 13th to, uh, to buy a car. She just wanted to buy a car. And so she did this horror movie thinking it wasn't going to take off. And of course it became the iconic role of her career. So I love stories like that when these very classic theatrically trained people like Donald Pleasance or Betsy Palmer get into horror and it becomes the role of their lives. So uh, Mm -hmm. I did not get to meet her. I did get to just meet Kane Hodder a few months ago. Um, He's awesome. uh, Yeah, he's so great. I I, I put in for uh, my company, Pop Horror. I, I do journalism for Pop Horror. I do film reviews all the time. Um, and uh, I put in for an interview. I, I wasn't able to get the interview, but I was able to meet Kane, get a picture with him. And he told me that um, he would he would do something special for me uh, as, an, as an indie director. He would work for me for a cheap price if, if I ever wanted him. So we did talk about possibly casting him in a future film. And boy, I would love to get my hands on a Kane Hunter role. Boy, that'd be great. But yeah, Kane was such a positive guy. Sean Cunningham was a positive guy. They gave great advice. Uh, for up and coming directors and writers. And I just love whenever my idols in horror and my bucket list guys that I want to meet in horror wind up being such positive influences and wind up mm-hmm. being as cool off screen as they are on screen. So cool. I agree. I agree 1 billion percent on that. And the Kane Hodder thing, you have to make that happen, man. You have to make that yeah, happen. I, like the, the second he told me that I could afford him, uh, quote unquote, he, he asked for my card. He said, one day you're going to cast me in one of your horror films. And I said, man, if I had a chance to work with Kane Hodder, there's so many creative things that I could do. I mean, I, I just, I do a lot of slasher stuff and I do a lot of character stuff. And that guy is a walking character. He is a he is, massive he is. man. He's a massive man. He's very intimidating, but he's very kind. He's, he's such a, a gentle giant. He's a great guy. And I really hope that someday I get a chance to work with that man because he is one of my idols in horror. I think he's everyone's idol in horror, right? Yeah. Yeah. He definitely is. He's just, and I think the biggest connection with him, like, he's my favorite Jason. I know people have others, like, from um, C.J. Graham, just, you know, which is cool. But I think my, my biggest thing is, well, one, part seven is my favorite. And then two, it's like, he's so, uh, not that the other ones aren't, but you see him a lot more. You know what I mean? Like, you see him a lot more. I read his, I had his book. I had his audio book. I downloaded his audio book, I should say. I listened to his audio book, which was amazing. I want to buy the hard copy of that. And then I watched his, um, the what is it telling back the biography on uh excuse me on amazon prime which was freaking amazing i haven't it seen it yet you, i want to see it yeah oh put it this way i think my wife teared up she she cries at stuff like that though mm-hmm. it's one of those it's one of those things like if you're an emotional person like if you if you're a crier you're gonna cry at that because it's just his story is just so it's so awesome it's so amazing and it's just like he even talks about, um, I'm not going to spoil it for you, but you know about the Friday the 13th, Jason versus Freddy, Freddy versus Jason, how you're supposed mm-hmm. to be in that and how they fucked him over with that. And just, just his life in general. Like when you see that, you're going to make it fly out. It's going to make you an even bigger fan of Kane Hodder. Yeah. Which, I mean, to, to me, he is the quintessential Jason Voorhees. I mean, I, I don't see how you could do a Jason film and not at least try to cast Kane Hodder in it because he, not only is he the, the stature but the economy of movement, the way the way that he moves, mm-hmm. he always talks about the head going first and the body following. He just has that perfect Jason Voorhees movement down to a T. It's, it's just it's just so much of the character. And uh, I sat down at, at the, uh, the the convention, the Steel City Con here in Pittsburgh, and I talked to him about the stunts and stuff that he did. And he mentioned Part Seven, that uh, being on fire for the for the world record at the time. He had the record for being on fire for yep. the most amount of time. He loves that stunt so much, and it's such an iconic visual. Horror is made up of all these important visuals and Kane just in part six, standing on the big RV as it's tipped over and like part seven of him be- being on fire and, and uh, coming up out of the lake and when he's chained up and just so many things that, that Jason Voorhees is known for Kane Hodder's movement and being able to portray a character in spite of the fact that you've got layers of makeup and prosthetics and masks on. He yeah. still makes you terrified of him, even though his face is covered. That to me is a sign of a great actor. Oh, I agree. See, well, CJ C. Graham was the one in part six with the RV, which was right. a powerful, powerful freaking scene. Did you just see him? You know how awesome that was? Just seeing him just stand on the RV as it's flipped over. I was just like, Shit. right. Yeah, I, I forgot that he came in through part, uh, part seven. It was, it was yeah. seven through one that had him in there. Yeah, seven, seven through X, and then 
Like, right. you, know, the, the, you know, the the only downfall of um, the ones that Kane Hodder was in is I wish he was in the ones with the better stories. Mm-hmm. But no, I, I, I totally agree, man. That's the thing. It's like as as much as like you you can you can appreciate X for being like so bad. It's good comedy, mm-hmm. and you know, Jason goes to hell. At least it had some kind of a story, even though the story came out of nowhere and it, it wasn't really well written at all. And uh, of course, Jason takes Manhattan, where he actually took uh, the. The, the the ocean crystal lake for 12,000 miles or whatever it was yeah and he took Manhattan for 24 seconds but yeah I mean it's uh he definitely got involved in some of the worst installments but his character stood out at least throughout it definitely and that that's not even to take away from the other people who played because I, I really feel like everybody who played Jason did an amazing freaking job I don't want to take away from any of those guys I just wish maybe not that Kane Hodder was in a different Jason and I just wish maybe those other ones had better stories I'll say that because those other guys did an excellent, amazing, amazing job, and I don't want to—I don't want to take away from what they did, because it—it sure. it would change the attitude of the movie. It would change the movie some, just because everybody did the role a little bit. They put it like their own. They made it their own role. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But, exactly. Yeah. It's that's the funny thing about being able to to cast um, different people in the same role is just seeing how their movements change and how they interpret the character. It's mm-hmm. very interesting. It I. Is. I uh, I had a chance to play a demon in a movie about, uh, I think it was in 2017, uh, and it's actually doing pretty well. It's got something like 33,000 views on YouTube or something like that. It's pretty crazy. But when I was playing a demon, my face was was shown, but I still found myself reverting to kind of some Kane Hodder style movements. He was my inspiration for how to play this demon character. Even though it's a different style of character, I just think that his movements are so strong and he uses his motion so well that he was kind of an inspiration for my character. That's awesome, man. That's that's cool. And Kane's one of those things that he's just an inspiring person. Like I said, definitely when you get a chance, Amazon Prime, check out that check out that to Helen back and you're gonna really, really, really enjoy it. And uh send me start posting your links in the group and stuff, the horror group. Don't don't be shy with that, man. Your YouTube, all that good stuff. Anything horror related, sure. feel free to share it. Yeah, I was gonna say I I've been lucky enough uh, since I came back into film. Uh, at the end of 2016, I had I had a film run where I was involved in the indie film scene from 2010 to 2013 uh, for about four years. And then I went away to go do Shakespeare acting and start writing books and doing uh, stand-up comedy and stuff like that. And then uh, in tw- at the end of 2016, I got the bug and I came back into film. And uh, in the last four years, I've been a part of something like 55 to 70 sets, something like that, mm-hmm. between, yeah, between acting, directing, producing, ADing. Uh, DPing, script supervising, uh, just production assistant, all that stuff. I've, I've been involved in, in something like, you know, seven dozen sets or something like that. It's been insane how, how busy I've been. So I've got links for days, man. I could, I could blow your group up with a ton of stuff. Oh, hell yeah. Like I said, anything horror related, give people more things to check out, more things to watch and all that good stuff. But um, I guess we could wrap this one up here though, man. We definitely got to do this again. Next time we should do a movie review. For sure, for sure, man. There's, uh, there, there's like, you know, there's, there's umpteenth amount of hours we could spend here talking about horror. We, we could break down each subject and oh, have know. its own podcast for every single thing. And uh, I've know. got so many projects coming out that are horror. We could also spend individual podcasts talking about each one of those, man. But yeah, I, uh, I'm obviously a diehard fan, and I'm producing constant content. Um, also doing self help blogging and stuff like that. But in terms of the horror. Uh, my photography storybook is coming out uh, in the next couple of days. It'll be officially up on Etsy, and then I'll start doing conventions once all this pandemic stuff passes, and I can awesome. breathe on you guys again. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, my next movie uh, is a uh, kind of a little bit horror, but Grave Encounters is, is, a, is a lot of drama and thriller as well. But that's coming out as well. And then I've already got uh, both my next novel is in beginning of production already. It is a is a clown uh, a clown haunted carnival slasher, mm. and I've also got my next movie, which is called A Soul's Window, which is another psychological thriller about paying for your past mistakes and being face to face with your wrongdoers. And that is being shot uh, in the spring as soon as the pandemic passes as well. So my next novel and next movie are both already in production. So I've got plenty of content coming. That's I I can't wait, man, and um. Yeah, definitely. Like I said, definitely share all your links and stuff. Thank you so much for coming on, taking the time to come on and talk some horror. And like I said, man, we definitely got to do this again. So definitely keep in touch. And if there's anything else you want to plug, go right ahead. Yeah, man, absolutely. I guess I'll just uh, I'll slide my, my novels in front of the camera for a second here. I've got uh, Never Say Goodbye is my poetry compilation. So if you guys like poetry about life and death and romance and the things we've been through in life and 
finding a positive uh, spin on things. Never Say Goodbye is on my Etsy page right now. We can link that down below. I've got my Scream style, uh, Who Done It, my 90s murder mystery behind empty eyes. I've got Fields of Madness, my Scarecrow Slasher, which you guys can see behind you as well. Uh, those are all available on Etsy right now. And uh, Leaping Woods, my 70s exploitation, is coming out soon. Uh, I've got a self-help blog on blogger.com, uh, my Twitter. If you guys want to get a hold of me and ask about different projects we've talked about today, uh, my Twitter is at jburke, that's J-A-Y-B-U-R-K-E. And uh, I've got a YouTube channel where I do, uh, I post not only horror films, but my newest one is up right now. But I also post different things about my novels, poetry, film reviews, sports reviews, Pittsburgh Steeler content here. Uh, that YouTube channel is Styles Clash for Life. That's S-T-Y-L-E-S-C-L-A-S-H, the number four, life, L-I-F-E, Styles Clash for Life. And uh, that's my YouTube channel. So get a hold of me on Twitter or YouTube. Uh, and I will send you guys whatever links you want to check out because I'm always creating and I hope you guys enjoy it. Awesome, man. See, now people, when I say plug your stuff, that's the way you do it. This, he, he knows what he's doing. <laughs> I, I, I've done plenty of these podcasts, man. And so uh, I've actually got, uh, I want to plug two more quick things and I'll oh, get out of your head. But, uh, go ahead. Yeah, I've got, I just did a filmmaker's podcast with a good buddy of mine who's one of the best sound guys in the local Pittsburgh indie film scene. Uh, Michael Ray is doing a uh, local 412 Pittsburgh Filmmakers podcast, and I just did that one on Monday, uh, hence where I get the podcast experience for plugging all this stuff. Mm -hmm. But uh, he, he's got a new series coming out, so look up Michael Ray in the, in the 412 Filmmakers podcast. And also, I've been doing, uh, I, I've been shooting uh, horror core music videos where it's like horror style rap. It's very Halloween and fall centric. It's got really cool beats. Uh, it's, it's got what would you call the horror core vibe. And it's, uh, it's music that, that's based on horror style stuff. And it uh, even kind of sounds like some of the soundtracks from some horror you guys might like, like nice. The Exorcist and Halloween. Uh, that is, the, the artist is Labyrinthine. So go ahead and YouTube Labyrinthine. We've shot a couple videos together that I've directed and ran the camera for. And several more are coming as well. So check him out also. That's awesome, man. And yeah, just um, I, all those links and stuff. Just eat, I mean, you can post the horror ones in the group and then email me the other ones. And when this episode comes out, I'll put it in the disc. I'll put them all in the description so people can find it all as well. But again, man, well, thanks for coming on. I, I, I definitely appreciate it, man. I, I just I enjoy this stuff so much. This is, this is a fun environment. I appreciate you giving a platform to independent artists. I mean, there's not a whole lot of places out there that, that are interviewing indie directors and writers and giving us a chance to talk about our passions and, and plug our projects. So I appreciate all your support. You you've just been a very kind person. And uh, you and I definitely vibe on an artistic level. We definitely have a lot of the same interests. So I'm sure I'll be on here again, but I just, I appreciate all you're doing, man, for us. Thank you very much. Any, and you're welcome, man. And anytime, it's just, a pat I love horror. So, so anytime I get a chance to talk about horror or anything, I'm just going to do it. But again, like I said, thank you so much for coming on. We will definitely be doing this again. And to all the listeners out there, as always, I'll see you in your nightmare.